it's an honor to be here. I'm excited to share with you what I've learned over the last 30 years about innovation, specifically disruptive innovation and what we call intellectual anarchy. To start, I'd like to talk about what I mean by disruptive innovation. What I'm thinking of are big, hairy problems that impact all of us, that impact the planet. And there's not much hairier and scarier than cancer. I lost my father at a relatively early age to cancer. One in two men in this audience will have a, an experience with it. One in three women. Over half a trillion dollars has been invested into cancer research since the war was declared in 1971. And still today, it's probably the most frightening thing out there. Now, you may remember a few years ago, there was a movie called Fantastic Voyage where you take people and put them in a submarine, you shrink them down and send them on a mission. We haven't done that. But what we have done is we've made nanomachines and we've sent them on a mission inside a small animal, a mouse, to kill tumors. We've had very good success with it and we've done it multiple times. And that's what I mean by disruptive innovation. Another example. Um, you don't have to look too far if you're in contact sports, you follow contact sports. If you hit your head, and you get injured and you bleed in your brain, you're going to have a really bad day. The Incas created or introduced a concept of drilling holes in your head, which is still what we do today to relieve the pressure. But what if you could point and shoot a laser that would actually cauterize the bleeding? We've actually done that. We've done it very successfully with pigs, pig models, uh, cadavers, and uh, large animals we're starting to work on. It's got enormous potential for emergency medicine. And I think in the future, it'll be a standard surgical tool. And one more example. We followed uh, self-driving cars, very cool stuff. But what if the road itself were smart? It's not since 1956 with the Interstate Highway Act that I think uh, this interstate highway thing was changed our economy and our society. But we've actually worked on a material we call nanite. It's uh, nanomaterials in cement and concrete. And it can actually measure and sense uh, cars structures. In the future, you'll be able to call up the road or it'll speak to you. It'll let you know when it needs maintenance. You can improve safety and reduce cost. This is a material that exists today, but it takes a while to get this kind of thing into the market. That's what I mean by disruptive innovation. Now, the way we look at things is we break up innovation into three buckets of interesting, challenging, and disruptive. Interesting are things that well, they're that. They're interesting. The things that people can do, they're fun. Challenging are interesting things that are complex. They're hard to execute. There's logistics and other kinds of challenges. Disruption is totally different. When you do disruption, if you're not a little scared, you're not there. When you do disruption, it's kind of like walking up to the edge of an abyss and looking out and there's no roadmaps, and there's no equations. That's disruption. What we learned a few years ago was we excel at disruption. And then we asked, why is that? Well, we've been practicing this for years, this intellectual anarchy, the art of disruptive innovation. And the three things you need to do to make this work are one, people. Now, this picture I took about a month ago in Dallas, Texas at the Perot Museum. This little kid was at this, there was an exhibit area for innovation. It was very cool. Usually when I get a chance, I go look at those things. And this kid was really focused on doing something, and his father was in the distance calling, but he couldn't hear him. The thing with kids is they don't know what they can't do. And this little kid was just having fun. He was going to make something. But then it struck me that this little kid was actually me. 
over 40 years ago. When I grew up, we moved around a bit, and I remember one summer moving into a house, and in the attic were boxes, boxes of junk, but one of those boxes was full of electronics. My brothers and I took it down, and Christmas came early for us. We started playing with things. So we, first thing, we started charging capacitors and practice shocking each other, kind of like an early version of a taser. We were practicing crowd control. And then we made an electromagnetic nail gun. Now, the Navy is working on an electromagnetic rail gun, same concept. And we continued to play and have fun until we overwhelmed the breakers, the power went out, and the fun was over. But these are the kinds of people that you need to do disruptive innovation. The next thing you need is culture and environment. Now, culture and environment is something that's talked about a lot. It's easy to say, but it's hard to do. It's a culture and environment that's safe, it's engaging, it's open. You can thrive in this environment. In psychology, there's a term they call flow. When you find your flow, things happen in sports. They call it being in the zone. When you're in the zone, you can do a lot of things. That's what I mean when I say culture and environment. Now, the last is organization. Most organizations look like this. I was on a long plane ride with the uh, dean of the College of Engineering from the University of Hawaii between Honolulu and Washington, D.C. We got into a very interesting conversation about a lot of things, but one of the things that was interesting is we both hire the same kinds of people. We hire young PhDs. We hire people that maybe the PhD program was too slow for them, and they just couldn't wait to get started on stuff, but they're all very bright and talented people. Now, in a university environment and in a large company, you're told to stay in your lane. In a university, if you want tenure, it's better if you stay in your lane. You focus on your research and your subject. Now, in a transdisciplinary organization, which is really built to innovate versus manage, and a typical organization is really built to manage and not to innovate, but for a transdisciplinary organization, you have those same people with those great skills and that amazing education. And you ask them to think about things that maybe they know nothing about, but are interesting for them. And what you get is a fresh set of eyes looking at a problem in a totally different way, but with the benefit of great skills and talent based on their experience and their education. A transdisciplinary uh, organization is really what you need to do. Just this type of work. So in summary, intellectual anarchy, the art of in disruptive innovation, really requires three things. First, you've got to find the kid. Pablo Picasso said it very nicely. Every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist when the child grows up. Likewise, every child is an explorer. And it's up to us, parents and teachers, to shepherd that explorer into adulthood. Second, you need the right culture and environment. So when that explorer shows up, they can get in the zone. And last, you need a transdisciplinary organization. If you want to look at the future, if you want to see 21st century jobs, Look through the lens of a transdisciplinary thinker. Thank you very much.